Okay, so before I, 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 I continue, there are two points that I wanted to make clear because uh, I, uh, there were some uh, notations and some things that I didn't uh, define properly. Uh, one thing was uh, uh, some of you were worried about the density matrix. So the density matrix is a, is a trick that people use in, uh, in uh, describing a, a, a quantum system. So there are various ways that I could define it. If you are in equilibrium, so if I take the density matrix, it's in equilibrium, it's the equivalent of the Boltzmann factor for statistical physics, except in that case it's an operator. So the density matrix is the suitably normalized uh, operator exponential of minus beta h, where beta is 1 over k bt and is the inverse uh, temperature of the system. And so that's one operator that you can use. It has its time evolution and so on that I don't want to write here. And so that's the operator you must use when you compute some of the average uh, um, of, the, of the, the system. So for example, when you have to compute the average of the current, it's a little bit more complicated than the one I've written, which is just the exponential of minus beta h, because you have to take into account the time evolution of this operator as well, which I don't want to write at that stage. So this is an operator which describes the evolution of the quantum system. If you were at t equals zero in a pure state, so in a single state, then the density matrix would just be the projector over this single state. So when you take the trace of any operator with the density of matrix, the trace is the sum over all the states of the Hilbert space. And so at the end, this gives you that this is just the average of the operator in this single state. If you have many states, let's say a thermal superposition of several states or so on, the density matrix has more complicated forms. So I think for what I want to do, uh, that's all I want to say about it. I don't think it's very important for the rest of the, of the, of the talk, but if you want to know more, don't hesitate to shout and ask me the, the question. My only comment is that uh, you don't need to have a temperature. No, you don't need to have a temperature. You can also have the density matrix so the, the time evolution of the density matrix operator is that it's 0 dt, and I always forget where is the i, but it doesn't matter. It's either i or 1 over i. I always forget it. Uh, so let's say i to some power, plus or minus 1, times the commutator of h and rho. So this, is, uh, this should be i, I think, not 1 over i. Yes, voila. Uh, the second thing, which uh, I, I went, of course, super fast, but again, it's not something I want to enter into details because we will not use the, them for the rest of the lecture, is the Feynman diagrams. So what are Feynman diagrams? It's a trick, which was, of course, as the name indicates, invented by Feynman a long time ago, which is a trick to visually represent the term of a perturbation theory. And so, uh, uh, t just to give you a, a, a kind of uh, uh, idea, uh, imagine that you, were, you wanted to do uh, some uh, multiple integral dx1, dx2, blah, 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 dxn of some complicated function exponential of minus, let's call it s0 of x1, xn, minus s1 of x1, Xn, where this is relatively simple. This is a Paolo, let's say, I don't know, uh, some, uh, some objects like uh, x1, x2, x3, x4, or something like this. And then you want to compute, I don't know, x1, x2. Now, what you can do, you can expand the second term by using the fact that this will be 1 minus x1, x2, x3, x4, time x1, x2. and continue to all orders. And now each one of these terms you can represent visually by saying, for example, when I get an x1, uh, let's say even, uh, let's put complex numbers, something like this. So when I get an x star, I will represent it by an arrow which emanates with a quantum number one. 
uh, when I get an x2, I have an arrow which destroys something with uh, quantum number two and so on. And you can represent each one of the term by this little arrow. And then the non-zero term in the expansion are the one where you connect properly the arrow and to which you attach to each line one Gaussian integral, one very precise Gaussian integral. And that's, a, again, a very visual way to write all the term in the perturbation expansion. So the more arrow you put, the more uh, the higher order is your perturbation term. But again, I don't want to go too much into details on Feynman diagrams. Again, Feynman diagrams This is a visual representation of a perturbative expansion. So if you know what they are, fine. If you don't know, don't bother. We will not use it for the rest. It's just a trick that is used to compute, for example, this perturbation in conductivity that I was mentioning, but I won't do the calculation, and I don't think, unless you really want to do the calculation, that you need to bother so much with the Feynman diagram. So at that stage, are there additional questions on what I said this morning, or additional worry on what I said this morning? Or did I lose you all immediately? No? 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 Okay, so let me go back to the, to the physics. So this is a perturbation expansion of the conductivity by taking into account this extra term that everybody said they are negligible. And this is done, of course, with the hypothesis that if you want, L is large. So the, the mean free path is relatively large. Of course, the size of the system is even larger than the mean free path. And again, you see that in 3D, well, OK, there is a correction, but it remains small. In 2D and 1D, it's a catastrophe because the correction would become much larger than the zeroth order term. So it just says that you cannot start from a good metal and assume that the mean free path is large. There is some catastrophe that is occurring. Now, how can one interpret this very uh, sort of physically? And so this is what I wanted to discuss. So this is interpretation in term of what people call the coherent backscattering. And okay, there are various origins for that, but for the effect of magnetic field, which I will not mention, but I, I need to give you the reference. I think it's important. The people who did that is Boris Altschuler uh, Aronoff and Boris Spivak. Uh. And this was done in GTP letters 33, 94. And this was done in 1981. So this is much later than, uh, than uh, Anderson. So uh, again, let's assume we have a good metal. So the impurities are weak, diffusing weakly the system. And now let's imagine that there is a wave or a particle, but let's say wave, which is scattering, which is arriving here, and then can scatter to the impurity number two, then scatter here. So it's a multiple scattering event where I would get uh, all this uh, scattering. And let's say I have this sequence of scattering event. And let me compute the probability in a way of the amplitude of the wave function at the origin. Well, I would say that I have two possibilities. If I have two different paths, so let's say if I have some other uh, path here where the particle can go, the wave function that would go back to the origin would be the sum of the wave function on path one plus the wave function on path two. So I tend to call my wave function psi rather than u, but except for that, it's the same wave functions. Uh, and the probability of presence of the particle at this point 
is the modulus of the wave function square, which normally, whoops, normally, will be modulus of psi 1 square plus psi 2 square plus 2 psi 1 psi 2 cosine of phi 1 minus phi 2, where phi would be the phase of the wave function 1 and phi 2 would be the phase of the, uh, of the uh, sorry, this is, sorry, modulus and modulus, uh, would be the, 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 the phase of the wave function 2. So in general, if you look at two different paths, the phases are random. So this cosine term will accumulate plus uh, whatever, minus whatever. So in, in average, this term simply goes away. And you find that for two different paths, well, the probability of being back is essentially the sum of all the paths. So this is more or less the classical result, and that's the one you would expect if you were having this Druder conductivity or this very simple result. But there is a case which is sick or, or, or interesting, let's say it that way. It would be the case where actually uh, you consider a path which is following the sequence of scattering in opposite direction. Because in that case, the phase which is accumulated on the contour is exactly the same than if you follow on the other direction, provided, provided that the scattering, if the scattering is time reversal invariant. So for all the models you saw this morning, this is the case. The scattering is only a potential, and so it doesn't matter if I change the sense of time. There is in physics form of scattering, which for example people call spin orbit coupling, which couples the uh, spin of a particle together with the momentum of the particle. So if now you reverse the, si the sign of time, you will reverse the sign of the scattering amplitude. So these are special impurities, if you want. That's not the normal type of impurity that you, that you have. But uh, if you have something like this, then everything that I'm saying here does not apply. It has to be modified suitably uh, for taking into account this uh, other scattering. But if I have a scattering which is time reversal invariant, then you see that phi 1 is equal to phi 2, which means that now the amplitude psi square is essentially 4 modulus of psi 1 square, which is twice the classical result. So as a result, because of this interference between paths which scatter reversibly on impurity, well, you have something which reinforces the probability that you don't move away from the origin. And that's the one which is actually at the origin of this correction. Actually, when I draw this diagram here, you can sort of, without understanding what the diagram means, forget Q, let's set Q equals zero. You have a particle moving with P, which is following a certain sequence of scattering on the impurities, and I have a particle moving with minus P, which is following exactly the same sequence. These are these two paths which are deduced by uh, time reversal symmetry. Now, I could give a crude estimate of the correction of the conductivity. For that, let's try to estimate the probability to return to origin for a diffusive motion. I told you, beyond the mean free path, the motion is diffusive, which means that I can worry, I can forget about all this. I have a kind of Brownian motion, if you want, and I just want to know what is the probability that the Brownian motion brings me back to the origin. Well, the, the probability uh, of going back to the origin, I don't know how to call it, little p, is equal to 1 over 4 pi dt to the power um, uh, d over 2 times the volume that I consider 
around the origin. So if I, if I say the probability that I find back my particle after it has meandered into a certain volume D3R, this is something uh, like this. So of course it decreases with the, with the time. Now, so big D is the uh, diffusion constant and little d is the dimension of space. Uh, uh, d, 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 dr, you're absolutely correct. D, dr, absolutely. No, 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 you're, you're, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, 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 you're, you're absolutely correct. Now, okay, I have to fix the volume of interference. So let's say I have two waves, and the wave packet has typical dimension lambda. It's not very, it's not very important. And what is D3R? If I have two packets which are moving with velocity v, uh, they have to intersect. And so the volume D3R will be lambda to the power d minus 1 times v dt. So this is when they cross each other. Uh, this is v dt is the dimension dx, if you want. And the lambda to the power d minus 1 are all the other dimensions. Which means that if I say I reduce the conductivity every time I have this probability of going back to the origin, you would say that the correction to the conductivity is proportional. Let me put the bare conductivity just to fix the units properly. To what? To, of course, with a negative sign because I move less away. And then I have this probability of going back, which is 1 over, and again, don't be too worried about the 4 pi's and things like this. So this is d over 2. This is lambda to power d minus 1. This is v. This is dt. And now I have to integrate over all the possible time that over which I can get this path. The minimum time that I can get, because otherwise I don't get diffusion, is the time tau for the mean free path, for, the, for, the, for the, the scattering time. So I will have here an integral whose lower cutoff is tau, because below my diffusive formula is not valid. And now the upper time should be infinite. But actually, in realistic system, there is a maximum time after which the path will not be quantum coherent because I don't know, some cosmic neutrino will pass through the sample, more, more, more likely there will be some thermal fluctuation that will prevent, that will affect the motion of the particle somewhere there. The particle will interact with something and this will break this coherence. So I have to put a maximum time here, which people call tau phi, which they call the phase coherence time. Okay, and now you see that uh, if, if I take this, the answer is relatively uh, uh, simple. If I am in d equal 3, sorry, I have to close my, uh, if I am in d equal 3, then dimensionally, you see that you get dt, um, uh, sorry, I miss uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I have a problem with my integral. Uh, no, no, that's correct. So if I am in d equal 3, I will, I will get something. OK, let's, let's do d equal 2. That will be simpler. So if I, no, no, I'll come back to d equal 3 in a moment. But let's do d equal 2. So if I am in d equal 2, I get something which is 1 over t. I get dt over t. So my correction delta sigma will be proportional to the log of tau phi divided by tau. OK? So you see that uh, essentially uh, in d equal 2 you recover the log except that in the, uh, um, in the uh, uh, formula that I put here uh, this was the size of the system and this was the mean free path. Here it's, it's done in, uh, in, uh, in time instead of being done in length but this is the same, uh, the same, uh, the same thing. In d equal 3, so again if I do d equal 3 I would find that my e, that my delta sigma 
Uh, and I still have a problem, but okay, I have to fix that. Uh, because what I would like to write is that d delta sigma is a certain constant times lambda square over L square times one minus tau over tau phi. And I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, so I, I need to correct it. I will give you the correction. No, because now I'm, I'm, it's probably the effect of being in front of the board. You know what they say, your IQ drops by 50 points when you're in front of the board, which uh, certainly can make it negative. Uh, so uh, if I have d equal 3, I would have said it's 1 over t, so dt over square root of t should be square root of t, so I'm a little bit worried about what I'm writing. But I'll correct, uh, and I'll give you the right, uh, the right formula. You're correct, it's the square root of pi, but it's drawn in notes. So the square root of pi... Ah, is the, is, the, is, the, is the square root of time is the distance, so okay, everything is going is going good. I forgot some square root here in my, in my formula. Okay, and indeed here it's correct because this is square root of tau phi divided by tau minus one. Yeah, I forgot, I forgot the square root in my, in my formula. Yeah. Square root of blah, blah. Okay, so the point I want to make is that you can recover essentially the same formulas than the one we got here except this time as a function of the dephasing time and as a function of the, uh, uh, let's say, scattering time. So again, to give you uh, typical uh, length scales, the L phi, which is square root of d times the dephasing time, so this is the length at which particle can travel without being dephased, is again between 0, 1 and 10 micron in a solid. Uh, you can also be dephased by thermal fluctuation, in which case you can define a length which is h bar d and the time, I need to do a time, so uh, I will divide by kbt here. h bar divided by an energy is a time, and so uh, this is the time that corresponds to the scattering to some thermal fluctuation, and this is again something between 0 0.03 and 1 micron. And uh, I could also be defaced by something which is not due to temperature, which is not due to some event which happens, but I could be defaced because I put a magnetic field. If you put a magnetic field, the path which is turning in one direction will not get the same phase than the path which is turning in the opposite direction. They will have opposite phase. And so, if you put a magnetic field on this, it's like changing the phase between the two paths. So when this phase reaches values of pi, you change the plus sign into minus sign. So you have a way to destroy this interference pattern by putting a magnetic field. And that's what this gentleman in this paper studied. So you can put a, a, a magnetic field and define a certain length, LH, which is again defined as the so-called flux quantum, which is the uh, uh, essentially uh, unit of, uh, of uh, magnetic field. It doesn't matter the expression. Just to give you an idea, this is one micrometer for a field which is 20 Gauss. So it means that by putting a magnetic field, you can control very well the uh, possibility of having this uh, uh, extra uh, intervention, and this is used experimentally. I don't want to discuss it, but I refer you to a, a review by Bergman. Uh, this is PhysRep Physics Report uh, 107, one, and this is 1984, where they use the magnetic field on very thin metallic films and by putting the magnetic field, they are able to show that the conductance of the system is oscillating as a function of the magnetic field. Uh, it's not Charvin and Charvin. This is a magnetoresistance experiment. Charvin and Charvin is on a cylinder. Uh, so it's a slightly different, uh, slightly different experiment. So again, uh, the, the, the point which is, which is important here 
is that we see that this correction which is coming on the conductivity is actually coming really because we have an interference effect which is controlling the fact that if I want to compute the probability to be there at the origin, I have to add the path that can be deduced by time reversal symmetry. And it's not something I would have, of course, for a classical particle, but this is something that I can get for a, for a wave. And we reproduce uh, with this argument very well the fact that, indeed, we get a correction which would be singular in 2D, which would be singular in 1D. By singular, I mean when the size of the system is going to infinity, we see the correction is not a correction. It's really the major uh, term. But then, of course, we cannot trust the very hypothesis that we had used, that we had a good battle. So we need to do better than that. So this is something which signals the fact that we can expect accidents in 1D and 2D. And in 3D, we can certainly expect that something special can happen if we make the mean free path very short. And again, this goes very well with what was said this morning. For weak disorder in 3D, we are safe. But maybe if the disorder becomes strong, we will have some uh, interesting accident that, that should happen. So this is the signature that there is an effect of disorder which goes beyond this Drude approximation and so on and so forth. And that's exactly what we are going to, uh, to study. There is a regime which people call the weak localization. Which is the regime when this correction is small. So you see that if I take a, a, a realistic system, even in 1D and 2D, uh, well, I mean, uh, if the size of the system is, uh, is uh, small enough, or uh, uh, I can perfectly, or if sigma zero is large enough, I can perfectly be in a regime where the correction is a small perturbation. So this also uh, tells you that if I take a little film of aluminum or whatever, I can still have a very good metallic conductivity, uh, even if here something weird should happen. Okay. So just to say that people have studied this in this regime. Okay. So now, uh, of course, the problem is that all these arguments are very nice, but certainly in 1D and 2D, they are complete crap because uh, we end up with a correction which invalidates the thing we were starting from. So uh, we started from a good metal with a large mean free path and whatever, with good conductivity, and at the end of the day, we end up with something where the conductivity would be negative or whatever, which is nonsense, of course. And, and therefore, we need to do a, a better treatment than the one that uh, we were doing. And for that, let me uh, now go to the scaling theory of localization. OK, so uh, first let me discuss in a second what I would call strong localization and also discuss some models. So you already had this morning uh, 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 various models, so I will just rewrite them rapidly because you saw them. Uh, you saw them. Uh, no, no, I, 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 I won't spend too much time on this. So there, there is the model in the continuum which is the p square over 2m plus v of r, where v of r can be either taken as a Poissonian, as we were uh, discussing already this morning, uh, where r0i is the position of the, of the impurity. Uh, people can take a v of r, which is taken with a Gaussian distribution and uh, essentially uh, as I was saying if for the Poissonian limit if ni is small and v0 is small 
then there is a central limit theorem which says that at the end it's like having uh, a, a Gaussian disorder with essentially a distribution which is directly related to an IV0 square. So actually if you have many, many, many impurities in a, in, a, in a region where the property of the system do not vary too much, whether you take Gaussian or whether you don't take Gaussian is, is not very important at that stage. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm not saying that uh, it's, uh, but it would be true if an I was really small, blah, 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 so let's, let's do it. The model that I would like to introduce was also uh, discussed this morning, or that I would like to comment a little bit. It's the so-called tight binding model. Just to say, is the model where you say, I have particles which are living on a discrete lattice, and they are able to up from one side to the next with a certain amplitude, which I can call minus t. It's not the time, eh? it's, the, it's the hopping amplitude. And so uh, in uh, uh, standard uh, quantum mechanics notation, I will write it in 1D, just for simplicity. That would be uh, this, where j is the wave function, is the particle on side j. And so I have a projector which projects the wave function on the side j, which means it destroys the particle on side j and recreates the particle on side j plus 1. That's the first model that was written this morning with an additional diagonal term uh, behind. Uh, and then, of course, you can put the, uh, uh, ad, ad the disorder as vj and something which is purely diagonal. So this is exactly up to a, a, an additional term jj, which was 1, uh, the model that was written this morning. And so... Sorry, oh yeah, yeah, sorry, plus, as usual, Hermitian conjugate, it's much better if my Hamiltonian are Hermitian conjugate, otherwise I'm, I'm running into trouble for the, for the eigenvalues. And there, for example, you can decide that the average of Vj1, Vj2 over the probability distribution, so this is the integral over dV1, dV2, blah, 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 dV omega of P of V1, V omega, Vj1, Vj2, normalized, okay, if P is normalized, this is equal to W delta J1, J2, which you can achieve by a Gaussian, for example, or a box distribution, uncorrelated from site to site for the disorder. So this is, you can take whatever you want. For reasons that both the central limit theorem gives you easily Gaussian disorder, and one reason which I might discuss at the beginning of the third lecture, uh, physicists like a lot uh, Gaussian disorder for convenience, but of course uh, there is no reason in nature where there should be Gaussian disorder. I mean most of the realization of disorder uh, are non-Gaussian. Gaussian disorder have also the drawback that they have long tails, which means potentially on each side you have a small but non-zero probability to get the disorder extremely strong or extremely negatively strong, which especially in low dimension can give bad effects like cutting a chain or something like this. So one has to be also a little bit worried about the distribution of the disorder. You might have artifacts depending on whether you take a box or whether you take a Gaussian or worse, a Lorentzian distribution of the, of the disorder. But pending these effects, most of the things I'm going to say are not depending drastically on the distribution of the disorder. Okay, so then of course the question you can ask there is what is the fate of the conductivity or the wave functions in general, but of course in particular at strong disorder. At weak disorder, it's one thing, but at strong disorder, it's even, it's even worse. And of course, what can be expected or what is expected is that maybe the wave function will start to decrease exponentially so that we will have some uh, exponential uh, decay of 
the wave function, psi of r, so let me write it that way, around a point which I call zero. Uh, and for the conductivity, we don't know. And there was actually a, a very strong debate. Uh, if I increase the strength of the disorder, uh, the conductivity is expected to go down, and then maybe a transition. But is the transition continuous? Is there, is there a jump? Is the conductivity going down smoothly? Uh, nobody knows. And just to give you one person, uh, Neville Mott, so uh, Sir Neville Mott, uh, was claiming that there would be a jump. So this is in Phil Magazine, Philosophical Magazine, B26. Uh, 10, 15, and this is 1972. He was claiming that there would be a minimum metallic conductivity. And let me put a big question mark here. Uh, his answer was no question mark, there, there would be. And the claim is the following. The mean free path cannot become smaller than the interatomic distance in a solid. So I can do whatever I want, but I cannot make the mean free pass smaller than the distance between atoms. And when I've reached that, it has to jump to zero. That was his claim. You, you might disagree with his claim, and you're, you would be right, but that, that was the claim. So uh, the point is that one needs to have a way to address this question. And for a while, it stayed very difficult to address because uh, perturbation theory is, of course, not working, as you see, or even smart perturbation theory. It gives you this correction, but it's hard to go beyond. And uh, numerics in the 80s was not very efficient, uh, so it was very difficult to extract reliable results of whether there would be a transition, no transition, uh, what would happen. Uh, and uh, it stayed that way until uh, there was a very influential paper which is the paper that I'm going to uh, discuss now in the, whatever, 15 minutes, I think, that I have left about that, uh, which is the paper on the scaling theory of localization. So at that stage, this will be very qualitative agreement, uh, arguments. And again, these are dirty ag arguments, but they were then cast into more precise uh, statement, and I will try to explain next time, tomorrow, a little bit how one can do it. And the core of the argument is actually due to Thales. Yes, so let me just write this reference. And, uh, okay, let's say I'll just write this one. So, in terms of examples that I already showed, uh, all these systems, uh, let's say if I have it here, whoops, all these systems can be in a weak localization regime. For example, the microwave, if you don't get uh, too many scatterers or if the scatterers are weak, what you will get, you will get a coherent backscattering that would reinforce the, 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 the um, uh, let's say, the possibility to go back in the direction at which you emitted the beam, but you will not suppress completely the transmission of the beam through the system. Uh, the simplest example that I can give is you take a film, very thin film of aluminum, if I was taking seriously the uh, perturbation that I'm giving, and if you trust that I can extrapolate this perturbation, uh, I would say technically the conductivity should always be zero. But actually, if you put numbers, I'll mention this probably not today, but tomorrow, the localization length is the Earth-Moon distance. Which means that if you look at the one centimeter square film, uh, yeah, it's localized, but you will never see it at the scale of the material. So what you just see is that the conductivity is lower than the naive value. And this is the regime that people call weak localization. So in a way, weak localization means either you are not in the localized regime, so the system is not localized, or you are in, the, in a localized regime, but the size of your system is so small compared to the localization length that actually 
the exponential decay of the wave function is not killing you completely for, for example, the transport properties. So you can still use a perturbation theory, or at least an intelligent perturbation theory, to compute some of the physical properties because this is regulated by the size of the system. So it's kind of instead of Exactly. So if you want, this is, yeah, exactly. So if I, if I was putting myself in the same situation, infinite system, then either you're localized or you're not localized. But if I take a realistic system like this, I'm just saying if I make the disorder weak enough, actually the decay of the wave function between this end and this end can be small enough that doing kind of second order perturbation theory is still an extremely valid approximation. And then you can extract, because okay, you could say fine, but then who cares? But you can care because for example, if you put this magnetic field, you will change the sign of this interference term, which is small now, but which is visible. So you will see that the conductivity of the system is an oscillating function or is some form of the magnetic field which is highly non-trivial, and this was measured. And I'll show, I'll show some image tomorrow. Exactly. So it's the localization length compared to the size of the system. If the localization length is much larger than the size of the system, you can still do reasonably intelligent perturbation theory, not the naive one, but and, and still have good chance to get correct results. But once you exceed the, the size of the system, exceed the localization length, then you're dead. All, all what I said, uh, for example, in the, um, uh, I mean, certainly trying to use this formula, uh, where is it? Sorry, I'm going too, too high. But certainly trying to use the fact that my correction is in log of L uh, over L. If L is much larger than little L, uh, it, it will exceed sigma zero. And then, uh, I mean, I don't want a negative conductivity. Uh, if this correction is 1% of sigma zero, uh, I can say I'm safe. The next term will be even smaller and so on and so forth. So this is indeed physical reality. Mathematically, either you're localized or you're not localized. Can, can I add that yeah. there is also a physical reality to the elementary phenomenon of coherent back scattering? Because this formula yeah. is a consequence of coherent, OK? The, the way conductivity is corrected is a consequence of a coherent back scattering. But we can observe directly yeah. coherent back scattering. For instance, in optics, you send the wave on scattering and you see that backscattering is reinforced compared to scattering in other directions. And we have shown the same thing with cold atoms. We send cold atoms on a disorder, and backscattering is reinforced compared to scattering in any other direction. And this is the elementary phenomenon which allows to explain this correction. You agree? Uh, which to measure this correction. So the point is that either in solid state by putting a magnetic field, or in optics by directly looking at how much is coming in your face when you send a beam, you can directly extract this correction and check that indeed it's present and would not be present for a classical, a purely classical system. So as long as this correction is small, you're still in good shape mathematically, if I can say, or at least uh, perturbatively. When this correction will become of the same order of the bare term, you have to find another tool. And there you're, there you're dead. OK, so let me uh, try to introduce the, the idea of scaling theory. So the idea is simple. What would happen if I take, and I'll do it in 2D because it's more easy for me to draw in 2D, but what would happen if I take a system which is made of a certain block of size L, and now I sort of look by putting this block close together, can I have an idea of how easy it would be to transport something through this larger system compared to what it would be to go through one of the block only? And this is a, a very standard technique in physics, which has been pioneered by Wilson in the mid-70s, which is called the renormalization group, which is to say, let's try to sort of apply an inverse microscope on a system I know the property at that scale. I will try to block 
to, to look at the system at a larger scale, knowing that at the end, what interests me are properties at infinite length scale. And if I know how to transform my system uh, from this scale to a larger scale, then I can reiterate the operation and hopefully understand what is happening at very large length scale. So this is a, a, a philosophy or an idea which is very standard since Wilson. I mean, this was a break. Wilson got the Nobel Prize for it. Uh, it solved uh, critical phenomena, phase transitions. And so the idea is to try to apply the same idea to the theory of localization. After all, if I get a transition between localized and delocalized, it might be like a phase transition. So can I sort of build a renormalization group which would uh, uh, try to understand if I have a little block like this, if I now I make a bigger block and then reiterate the procedure, whether I get good conductivity or bad conductivity. And so the argument of Thaules goes as follows. He's saying that if I have a block, I have a certain spectrum in the block with kind of random energy level. So if I solve the eigenstates, uh, of this uh, solution. There is disorder, of course, in the block. I get a lot of eigenstates and I get random energy levels. Now, uh, if I want to estimate the broadening of these energy levels, I can do it in the following way. Uh, I can say what time would it take for a particle to go through the block? The time it would go for a particle to go through the block is the L square divided by the diffusion constant. Because again, if I have diffusion, L square is proportional to the time. So I can say if I have a block of size L, the time it would take for a particle to find the other end of the block is L square divided by D. And now I can apply the uncertainty principle which says if my particle is inside the block for a time t, delta E delta t is h bar. So I have an uncertainty on the energy level here, delta E, which is h bar divided by t, which is L square times t. So it means that if I look at the energy level of these blocks, because my particle is only spending a certain time in the block because it diffuses and go away, then uh, the particle has an uncertainty on its energy, uh, sorry, the, the, the block has an uncertainty on its energy levels, uh, which is uh, the one I've written. Now, if I put several of these blocks, can the particle jump from one block to the next? Well, the idea is that if I have an interval between the level which I will call delta W, in first approximation, the particle will be able to jump in the case which is not the one that I'm drawing here. The particle will be able to jump from one block to the next if the broadening of the energy levels is larger than the interval between the energy level of the next block. Otherwise, it will just find a place in energy where there is nobody else and the particle will stay inside the, inside the block. So the idea of Thaules is to say that the localized or delocalized property depends only on the ratio delta E delta W. In other words, if this ratio is large, I move. If this ratio is small, I'm stuck. Now, this is not a very nice quantity, so let me rewrite, let me rewrite it for you. So if I write the conductivity, which I gave you before, I said it's E squared times the diffusion constant times the density of state, and because this is not proportional to the size of the system, this is the density here, divided by sort of derivative dnde, so it's not proportional to the size, which means that delta E, I can re-express with the expression which was before, so I, I substitute the, the, the diffusion constant, it's h bar 
it's divided by e square divided by dn d and uh, what did I forget? Uh, boo, 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 boo. Uh, yeah, um, and this is uh, and this is sigma here. Now, I want to uh, I want to um, uh, sorry uh, I want to uh, change my uh, density of state to the total. Uh, number of uh, of uh, of state uh, sorry no what, what am i doing no 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 i'm confused about something i was going to say uh, so here i think is correct d is sigma so if you want d is sigma over e times dn d so if i substitute i get that delta e is h bar sigma e squared dn d so that, I'm, uh, that I am uh, very happy. And now, uh, yeah, now what I would like to, uh, sorry. Ah, yeah, yeah, I forgot an L square. You're absolutely correct, voila. Sorry, L to the minus two, now I am happy. Okay, so now I can write that D is equal to H bar divided by E square. So DN, D is D, DN. So this is D, DN. But I can multiply by L to the D, and here I can put L to the D minus 2. And N times L to the D, it's the total number of state in the cube. So this is delta E is H bar over E square DE DN times, and I forgot the sigma, times L to the D minus 2 times sigma. Okay. Now, uh, if you look at this expression, what is DEDN? DEDN is the number of state that I have per energy interval. So DEDN is my uh, spacing between levels. So I'm just saying that the ratio delta E over delta W is H bar over E square <coughs> times L to the D minus 2 times the conductivity sigma. And now if you look at this quantity, and if you remember what we did this morning, this is exactly what I call the conductance of the problem. Uh, this is the total, it's the inverse of the resistance. That's the total possibility that the system has to conduct for a block of size L. So what I'm telling you here is that this is h bar over e square, sorry, not h bar square, but h bar over e square, times the conductance of the problem. And if I normalize my conductance in units of h bar over e square, I can write them like that. So this is the normalized in units of h bar. Oh, in the conductance. So this is this is the conductance of the. So little n, which is the density oh. times L to the D, becomes the total number of, uh, of states. The main message, forget the E square over H, it's not very important at, at that stage. The main message is that if I believe Thouless, the claim is that the way the system will become localized or not delocalized is only dependent, that's it, there is nothing else, is only dependent on the conductance of a block of size L. So if I want to know whether by putting together a block of size L in several blocks, I will get a metal or an insulator, the only quantity I need to know is the conductance of the block itself. I don't need to know the disorder, I don't need to know the density of states, I don't need to know the kinetic energy, I, don't, I just need to know the conductance. So I have one parameter, that embeds, as far as transport is concerned, I'm not talking about other quantities, but as far as transport is concerned, which tells me whether ultimately the system will be an insulator or will be a metal. Which means that if I wanted to do, uh, uh, to write the way the conductance varies with the size of the system, I can write a differential equation
which tell me, and it's written that way because it's convenient to write it that way, which is that the derivative of the log of the conductance as a function of the size divided by the, sorry, divided, sorry, differentiated with the log of the size. Why the log is because it's, it's let's say, historical reasons, is only a certain function which people usually refer with the letter beta, a function of the conductance of the system itself. Okay? So this is a remarkable statement because it tells you that if you want to predict how the conductance of a block, let's say, of four blocks of size L is behaving, the only thing you need to know is the conductance of the lower block. And then you can iterate. Okay? Of course, you have no clue what this function beta is. Because what is written here is something which was based on Holmes law. When I say the conductance is L to the D minus 2 times sigma, this is my addition of resistance in series and in parallel, which of course will probably not be valid with uh, a, a more realistic system. Okay? But that's exactly where the gang of four came in, and I think I probably should stop. Maybe I can tell the end of the story if we, are, if we have two minutes. Okay, so this is where Eliu Abrams, Phil Anderson, the same. Uh, Licciardello, I will try not to squeeze Licciardello and TV Ramakrishnan. So they said something which is simple. PRL, 42673-1979. They said, OK, we don't know what is the beta function, but let's try to guess it. So let's try to guess it. And I'll stop on this. If I have a good metal, It means G is large. Good metal means large conductance. But if I have a good metal with a large conductance, it means Holmes law is probably valid, which means the conductance is behaving as the conductivity times L to the power D minus 2. So let's take the log. And if I take the log of this and I differentiate with log of L, it's very easy to see that beta of G of L is behaving as D minus 2. Now, let's say I have a bad metal. I'm localized. Well, I don't know what will happen, but if I am localized, most likely my conductance will decrease as exponential of minus L of xi, where xi will be some localization length. Okay? Now, it's very easy with this to say, to see that beta of G of L is, just replace, is the log of G divided by a certain constant, which I call G0. Okay? So if G is small, so of course this means G large, here it means G small. Okay? Sorry, G0 here. Now, if I have this, you see that I have the two limiting values so this is G, this is beta of G, this is 1, 0, and minus 1. Now if G is large, in D equal 3, oops, in D equal 3, my beta function would be roughly 1. And if G is small, my beta function is log of G, which is negative. So it's doing something like this. Now if I am in 2D, if I am in 2D, G is 0. And then it's something negative here. And if I am in 1D, whoops, then this is minus 1, and this is again log. Now of course, everything can happen here. But why not connect the dot in the simplest possible way? So if I am in 1D, I will connect the dot like this. If I am in 2D, 
I will connect the dot like this. And if I am in 3D, I will connect the dot like this. And then when the function beta is positive, the derivative is positive. So g is growing. So it means that if the function is positive, g will grow. If the function is negative, g will decrease. If I am here, the function is always negative, so it always decreases. And here, the function is always negative, so it always decreases. So you see that with these very simple arguments, you find something which is quite remarkable, which is that you can start with any conductance here, even very large. But if you're in 1D and 2D, the conductance of a larger block will be smaller. And then an even larger block will be smaller. And an even larger block will be smaller. And at the end, it scales to 0. On the contrary, if you're in 3D, you find that there is a point if you're above this conductance, then the conductance will scale to larger and larger conductance. So the system will become back a good metal. And if you're below this critical conductance, then the conductance will scale down and the system will be localized. So it tells you that in D, I mean, if you believe this argument, that in D equal 3, there is a metal localized transition. and that in 2D and 1D you're always localized. So this is going beyond simple perturbation theory. This is valid, uh, strong coupling, weak coupling, it doesn't matter. And this is very consistent with what we got from the perturbation theory. So my time is up. I think it's a good time to stop here. But what I will show you tomorrow is that, A, one can squeeze the lemon and extract from this very simple theory the behavior of the localization length close to the transition and also the behavior of other physical quantity close to the transition. And of course, you could complain that this is really too simple and one should do a better job in trying to nail down a little bit this behavior. And I will briefly mention, because I don't think it's that interesting, type of methods that people used, either supersymmetry or replicas, that people used to try to nail down a better calculation of this beta function, because at that stage, it's just extrapolation between two limiting regimes. But the point is very important, is that if you believe in this two limiting regime, there is very little you can do to avoid the transition in 3D. So to have a metal insulator transition in 3D as a function of the initial conductance of the system, which means the strength of disorder or the energy of the particle or whatever. So you will have what people call a mobility edge that is predicted in 3D. Voilà. I think it's good time to stop here. If you have questions, I take them. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I was longer than. Yeah. So why should we trust this theory of a scaling? Uh, okay. <laughs> because Wilson got the Nobel Prize for it. <laughs> no. So more, more seriously, uh, again, the idea that by assembling pieces and looking at the system at a larger length scale, this is a very natural thing to decide what will be the behavior of a big system. If you want, it's a Lego uh, picture. And this is, as I said, something that worked remarkably well to explain normal phase transition. So phase transition driven by temperature. This was a very successful procedure. So applying this procedure to potentially what would be what people would call a quantum phase transition, which is a transition not driven by temperature, but driven by the change of a quantum parameter, which, let's say the strength of the disorder, this is a very natural idea. Uh, why you should trust it? Again, uh, this is physics, 
So the, the way is always you assume that something will work, you make predictions which are not the one you put inside the theory to start with, and you try to compare with some experiments. If it works, you're happy. If it doesn't work, you put everything in the trash can and you start all over again. So if you want to tell me why one should trust it, well, if someone can prove it, that's, uh, that's the right attitude. But here, you see that the arguments are extremely qualitative. So of course, people did much more serious calculations that I'll briefly mention tomorrow to put some flesh. Because also connecting, you could have said, why don't you have five intersections? Why, why should it connect smoothly? Why not do something like this? And there, I have no answer. Yes. Yes. So there is. I will mention it. Uh, I will mention tomorrow. So the best numerics. Okay, the best. I don't know if it's the best, but some recent numerics by Kamers and McKinnon, 1993, or uh, Slavrin and Otskuni, uh, 1999. They are perfectly in agreement with these things, as are the uh, supersymmetry and the um, replica methods. But this one work in a two plus epsilon expansion. So epsilon has strictly speaking, to be small. So I'll, 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 I'll mention the numeric tomorrow. And we have also experiments, so localization is So localization is not a problem. You just make the disorder very, yeah. very large. Yeah. The point is the metal insulator transition in 3D. Uh, and also, by the way, this is as much a result as the other. The fact that in 2D, the system would be always localized. This is a result. Uh, you could say, why not have uh, two critical values? For example, this goes up and this goes down after. So that's... Uh, okay, that's I think, uh, I think we have yeah. to stop uh, now. Okay. okay.